what are those things that can be landmark for, for, for progress. Now, if I, let's, let me use the same example. If you are studying to be a doctor and in your under level, you add C in one course. Yes, maybe that's not the best uh, 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 scenario. Or if you want to be the first in your class and it's your goal to be the first this time, but in same mathematics, you add, uh, uh, you add 60. Maybe that's not the best score you can get, but that's not the worst score you can get. So that's a progress, especially if you are a student that struggle with mathematics. So you have to look at those small, small things you can celebrate. Those small, small markers you can see as progress. And we will look at example of Job in the Bible. I know we all know Job. Job was a very wealthy man. He was a godly man. He had everything. He had children. He had wife. He, he, had, he had farms. He had cattle. He had sheep. He had everything he wants. But the devil came and brought difficult situation to Job. He lost everything. He lost his farm, his cattle, and he lost it. His friends came. His wife told him, "Cause God and die." His friends came and said, "You are suffering from your the, 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 this 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 is a result of your sin." But Job did not give up. He had something at the back of his mind. And that word had at the back of his mind can be seen in Job 19, 25 to 27. He says, I know, this uh, KJV version, he said, I know that my Redeemer liveth and will raise me up from the dust at the last day, my decay skin. And I in my flesh shall see God. I shall see him myself with my own eyes and not through the eyes of some other see, and not through the eyes of some other see him. In expectation of this, my heart do join within my bosom. Despite everything that is going on around him, he had that goal in his mind that one day, even as I go through all this, I'm going to see my God because I know my Redeemer lives. And he said in verse 27, and in expectation of all this, my heart rejoices. My heart celebrates that even in my present situation, I can still look forward to saying God. That is the first step. The second step is I should recall my priorities. I need to recall my priorities. What are those things I'm trying to do? What are the things that are priorities for me to do what I want to do, for me to get to where I want to do? B, what are those priorities? What are things I needed to get to my goal? What are things that are needed to get to where I want to be? If I need to be first in class, my priority will not be to, to uh, uh, start watching movies when I'm supposed to be reading or start playing with uh, on serious students when I'm supposed to be doing other things. I need to know what are the priorities, what are my priorities to get to where I want to get to. And that is number two in how to overcome difficult situations. You have to recall your priorities. What are those things you want to be? So even if you are in a financial difficulty right now, things are not going on very well. But you have, to, you have it at the back of your mind that despite the fact that it's a struggle, but I must be first in my class. I must study this course. I must do this business. You need to know what are those things you need to get to where you're going to. You need to know what you need to do to get out of that difficult situation. What are those things that I know that, okay, despite the fact that there are financial difficulties right now, my, my, my future is bright. If I become a doctor, I will be able to lift my environment out of this difficult situation. 
I will be able to lift my family out of this difficult situation. So you have to know what you need to do to get to where you're going to. And what are your distractions? What are the things that can distract you? And trust me, there are many distractions everywhere. There are distractions everywhere. You need to know what are those things that can distract you. And when you see those things that can cause distraction, then you'll be able to move away. You'll be able to run away from those distractions and focus on your end goal and focus on the big picture. Hebrews 12, 1 to 2, I believe all of us know these verses. It says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and sins that are so easily entangled. But let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us throw off everything that hinders, everything that distracts, get rid of them, and run with perseverance. Run with perseverance. That is to say, you know that even in this difficult situation, you have to run with perseverance the race marked out for you. And race, as a Christian, we have different races we are running. The race to be with our Lord at the end of, the, uh, at the end of our life, to, to, to rejoice with, with, with God in heaven. That's one race. The race to be godly, to live a godly life in our environment is another race. We have different races we are running as Christians, as a believer. So you need to look at what are those things that can so easily distract. And Job is another example. His friends became a distraction at some point. He told them, are we going to take good things from God and not take evil? They have to tell them straight that even all these things you're saying, I know that my God will not forsake me. I know that this situation, despite the fact that it's difficult, it is not the end for me. The next is you have to aim for small victories. You have to aim for small victories. It is very, very easy for us to, to, to neglect those small victories that God has given us along our ways. Those small, small victories that we are getting along the way, it is very, very easy to forget about them because it is not where we are going to. It's like somebody that is looking for uh, 100,000 to start, say, Benisig, uh business. And somebody gave that person, or somebody gives that person 5,000 naira. It is easy to say, ah, 5,000 is a small money compared to the 100,000 I'm looking for to start this business. But you have to know that that 5K, that 5,000, as small as it is, is one step closer to where you're going to. And you have to celebrate those small victories. All those small, small, you, you, you want to become a doctor. But instead of you to have A in a course, you have B or C. It is easy to say, this is not what I want to be. But you have to celebrate those small, small, you have to be gracious and grateful for those small, small victories. And how do I look out for these small wins? They are all around us. It is easy for us to, to focus on difficult situations. Sometimes it becomes so easy to focus on what is going on around us. And those small, small victory God has given us, good health, uh, uh, provision of meals, uh, 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 our loved ones in, in good health and in not in any trouble, it is difficult to overlook those things. But those are small, small wins God is giving us to make sure we get where we're going to. Those are small, small victories we need to celebrate. How do you celebrate them? Be grateful. Thank God for them. And in thanking God, you're celebrating what God has done in anticipation for many things he's going to do. So even in difficult situation, learn how to celebrate small, small victory. The next one is talk to God. 
Talk to God in prayers. Talk to God in prayers. It's easy to be overwhelmed with situations, with uh, 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 bad situations that sometimes we forget we need to talk to God in prayers. We need to commit this situation to God in prayers. How do you pray? You have to pray with faith. You don't have to... Sometimes when the art is overwhelmed, you might not be able to pray for a very long time. But when you know that you're talking to your father in heaven, then you pray with faith. God, help me. Who remember that story of Peter with Jesus in the, in the storm? When Jesus was praying and the, the, Jesus went to pray and the, the, the disciples, they were in, in the boat. And Jesus, they saw Jesus walking on water. They saw Jesus coming to them on water. Who is this man coming on water? Oh, it's me, Jesus. And he said, can I come and meet you? Can I walk on water like you? Then he jumped to the water and he was walking on water. But as long as he shifted his focus from Jesus, he started sinking. But one thing he did that was so, so commendable was that single line of prayer. Help me for I'm sinking. It's a prayer of faith. We need to know how to pray those prayers. It doesn't have to be a long prayer. But when you say it with faith, help me, Lord. Help me out of this situation. And I know it's going to help you. When do I pray? The Bible says we should pray at all times. In good times, in bad times, pray. And does prayer work? Uh, please, let me tell you now, prayer does work. Don't believe otherwise. Don't think otherwise. Prayers work. Prayer of faith works. So, as many times as you can, talk to God. Pray. The book of Psalm says, Psalm 50 verse 15 says, And call on me in day of trouble, and I will deliver you, and you will honor me. It's as simple as that. That's God's promise for us. That we should call unto him in day of trouble and he will deliver us. Example of people who pray in difficult situations. Paul and Silas. Uh, in Acts 16, 16 to 35, let me just tell you that story. Paul and Silas were thrown into prison. The, the, the prison door was bolted. They were, they, were, they were chained in their arms and legs. The prison door was was bolted short, was locked with big padlock, and there was still guard in front of it, guarding them, just to make sure they don't escape. But they started praising, they started praying, and they started praising the Lord. And before you know it, the chain on their hands and on their leg broke, the door to the prison, the prison door broke, and even the, 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 the guard of the, of the prison, when they saw all this, was afraid. Ah, the people that I was told to guard, they've escaped. But they told him, we are here. And even in that, in that simple or singular situation where they pray in difficult situation, they were able to, to preach to the, jail, to the jailer and his family. And they all gave their life to Jesus. And they all gave their life to Jesus. So, when we pray, even in a difficult situation, many things can happen. Landmark miracles can happen. So please pray when you are in a difficult situation. Another, another, uh, 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 the fifth, the fifth uh, uh, point is talk to people. Accountability. Have people you talk to. Have people you can discuss your issues with. Let me tell you a story about myself. While I was in school, while I got to 100 level in school, I started doing all manner of things. Started drinking, I started smoking, going around with different type of, 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 of boys. They were not helpful to why I was in school. But I came around a group of friends group of Christian brothers 
that shared the gospel with me. And ever since, more than 15 years ago, there have been people, there have been a moral beacon, there have been people helping me in every situation I find myself. There are people I can call and say, I'm in this situation, and they will advise. I tell you, when you do this alone, especially in difficult situations, it becomes more difficult. You need to look for people you can talk to. And who can you talk to? Like example, Aunt Abisayo gave us yesterday about Ammon and Tamar. That's a wrong example we can, fo we, we, we can follow. You need to look for godly people to talk to. The people in your Bible study groups, your uncles and aunties helping you to study Bible, helping you to grow in Christ. Those are people you can talk to. Those are people you can walk up to and say, auntie, uncle, I'm in this problem. Auntie, uncle, this is what is going on in my family. Those are people you should talk to. Godly people who can help you grow in Christ, who can help you become, to, 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 to come out of that difficult situation. Those are people you should talk to. Don't go and talk to, uh, 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 don't be like uh, uh, Ammon that went to talk to his friend and give him bad advice. Talk to people who will give you godly advice who will put you on the right track. Is it important to have people to talk to about my situation? It is very, very important. It is very, very important that you have people you talk to when things are not going on well. Even when things are going on well, you should have people that can help you in your situation. Always, it is very important to have those type of people. It is very, very important to have those type of people. Like Hebrews 10, 25 to 26 says, and let us not give up meeting together as some as an iron habit of doing so. Let us not give up meeting together. He said, verse 24 said, let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. So look for people who will be able to spur you on, who will be able to encourage you, motivate you towards love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together. Make sure you are, you are, you are, you are, you are talking to people who can help you. Don't go astray talking to people who will take you away from God. The next is you must have a grateful heart. You must have a grateful heart. Do I have to be grateful even in difficult situations? Yes, you have to. You have to thank God in every situation. You must thank, learn how to thank God in every situation. When things are good, when things are bad, thank you, God. Learn how to thank God in every situation. Learn how to say thank you, Jesus, in every situation. And I tell you, it's going to help you a lot. It's going to help you a lot to know what is right and what is wrong. It's going to put things in perspective for you. So you will know that God has your back always. Learn how to thank God in all situations. Is it easy thanking God even when situations are difficult? Is it easy to thank God when things are not working well? No. That is the truth. It is very, very difficult to have a grateful heart when things are difficult. But you must learn how to say thank you. Let me give you an example of Habakkuk in Habakkuk, 7, in Habakkuk 3, 17 to 19. In Habakkuk 3, 17 to 19, it says, though the fig tree does not bud, and there is no grape on the vine, Though the olive oil crop fail, and the field produces no food. Though there are no sheep in the pen, and no cattle in the store, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet 
He makes my feet like a feet of, the, of a deer, and he enables me to tread on height. See what the, the what Abacock said there. He painted different situations. But he said, I will, I will rejoice in the Lord. Even when this don't work, even when that don't work, even when this is wrong, even when that is wrong, even when there is no food, the feed is not producing food. He said, yes, I will rejoice in the Lord. Have a grateful heart in difficult situations. And lastly, practice self-compassion, practice compassion and self-care. Practice compassion and self-care. The idea, the question is, can I help people even when I am in need? When I need help, can I render help to people? Yes, you can. You can be help to others even when you are in need. You can be helped to others even when you are in need. You don't have to have it all for you to help people. When you see people in need, you have to come to their situation. You have to help them. You have to practice compassion. And you have to take care of yourself. Because situation is difficult doesn't mean you should not take care of yourself. How do I take care of myself when things are not going on well? Sing. Make merry in the Lord. When things are not going on well, sing, clap your hand, dance unto the Lord. Take your bath, use oil to clean your face. Don't let people look at you and say, oh, this, place, this person is soft. Sing and dance to the Lord. Do exercise. Make sure you do exercise. Even when things are not difficult, do exercise. As you're doing those exercises, keep praying to God. Keep thanking God because you know at the end of the day, you're going to come out of that situation. And in conclusion, I, I, there is no better verse to conclude than what Jesus told his disciples in John 3, in John 16, 33. He said, I have told you all things so that in you, in me, you may have that peace. In this world, you will have trouble. But take us, I have overcome the world. Jesus is telling us that there will be, an, there will be issues. He's not promising us a difficult free life. There will be issues there and here and there. But he's telling us that take us, he has overcome the world. He has overcome that trouble. He has overcome that difficult situation. So, in, in, uh, uh, to recap, remember, number one, keep the big picture in your heart, in your mind, define what is success for you. Number two, recall your priorities. What are my priorities in all this? What are things I need to do to get to where I'm going to? Number three, aim for small victory. Celebrate those small, small victories God is bringing your way. Number four, pray. Pray to God. In, go to God in prayers. And I tell you, God will answer and hear your prayers. Number five, talk to people. Have brothers and sisters you can talk to. Have brothers and sisters you can talk to. Uh, um, uh, there's an African proverb that... Uh, Uncle, Uncle Kenny just shared with me now. He said, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go further, go together. You need a community of people to help you go further in life. You need community of people, of godly people, of like-minded people to help you in those situations. Number, 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 number of, uh, six, have a grateful heart. Be thankful for everything in good, in bad, in ups and downs, thank the Lord. And lastly, and lastly, practice compassion and self-care. Thank you very much for uh, listening to me. Please, if you have any question, don't hesitate to uh, put them across. Um, this uh, is the end of the first workshop today. Thank you, and thank you very much. I had a fruitful day so far. Um, 
I would love to do a little recap of what we um, what we learned yesterday. Remember, I promised to ask about our memory verse, our scripture memory. So, who is willing to um, recite yesterday's memory verse on having Christ-centered relationships to the opposite sex? <laughs> Okay, I see Judy again from Olowa. Judy, you want to go? Who wants to help her? Okay, I that. Why did you mute it? I thought you wanted to try that out. Who wants to go? Should I promise a gift for the person that gets it? Maybe that will motivate you. Or should I call names now? I know a few names already. Should I call names? Remember, I told you to memorize scripture. One of the things we learned yesterday on how we can help have better relationships with the opposite sex was memorizing God's word. Psalm 1199 and 11. Okay, I can see someone in Unale raising up his hand. Psalm 1199 and 11 says, How can a young man keep his way pure by living according to your word? I've eaten your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. So... Memorizing scriptures, hiding God's word in our hearts and applying them is one good way. Okay, what's your name for Munale? You raised your hand. You want to try? Uh, my name is Favor. Favor, okay. Oh, yes, I remember you from yesterday. You're asking questions now. Don't worry. Keep it going and that gift might just come. Okay, Favor, go ahead. First Timothy. Chapter 5, verse 1 to 2. Do not rebuke an older man, Ashley, but treat him as if your father, and treat younger men as your brother. Then treat women as your sister. And an abs absolute purity. You want to try again? That's one. Okay, now try it again. First, first Timothy chapter five, verse one to two. Do not rebuke an older man as she, but, but exhort him as if he's your father. Treat younger men as your brother. Mm -hmm. Then treat women as your sister with absolute spirit. Purity. Thank you, Favor. You tried. First Timothy. First Timothy 5, 1 and 2. Treat younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, and younger women as sisters with absolute purity. Thank you. Who else wants to try? I'm here. Okay. What's your name? I can see yeah, that Banabas. still from Unale. Oh, yes. yes. Banabas answered my question yesterday, too. Okay, Banabas, go ahead. Okay. First Timothy 5, 2 and 1. Do not... One and two. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. First Timothy... First 
to be five, one and two. Do not rebuke an older. Do not rebuke an older man harshly, but um, the if is your father. Older woman as your mother. Younger woman as your sister. With, with absolute purity. Barnabas, I noticed you removed completely the men and you dealt with only the women. Treat younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, and younger women as sisters with absolute purity. Thank you. It's, it's good that you gave it a try. I can recognize one of my friends from Ibadi behind Barnabas. I've forgotten your name. You were very, very participating when I was in Ibaji the last time. Your face is still very, very clear. Hello. Welcome again, everyone. Today, so yeah, remind me what's your name? You are sitting down on the chair up behind Barnabas. I call Marvelous Ma. Marvelous, yes, I remember Marvelous. Marvelous, how are you? It's good you are still connecting after all these years. Well done. Okay, so today we will be talking about honoring God's temple. Let me see if I can share my screen. Who knows what God's temple is? Honoring God's temple. Let's see. I share. Okay. Yes. I've given you the expo. Can you see my screen? Yes, I'm yes. sorry. Okay. Just move into PowerPoint. Into your presentation, okay. sorry. Slide presentation. Yes. Let's see. Okay. Excellent. Honoring God's temple, our bodies. How can we honor our bodies, which is God's temple? Sorry, I have another scripture memory for you. Can you can you memorize too much Bible verses? Is there a time in your life where you say, Oh, I know enough Bible verses, I'm okay? Yeah? Remember, I'm not the only one that will, who will be talking. We will be participating. It's a workshop. Remember, there is a work there. So you have to do the work also. I'm not the only one who will be talking, okay? So I would love that we are all quiet so that when it's time to talk, um, interference, there won't be any interferences. Okay, so I said you can't memorize too many Bible verses, okay? Because God's work. God is our lifeline as Christians. God's word is our lifeline. We need more scripture memory, more Bible verses through our sojourn on heads. Okay, so um, I hope you can still hear me. My yes, please. Is going on and off. Okay, so our scripture memory for today will be from 1 Corinthians 3, 16 to 17. Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit lives in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God. God will destroy him. For God's temple is sacred and you are that temple. You are God's temple. Okay? And God's spirit lives in you. What is a temple? Let's start with that. What is a temple? Who knows what a temple means? I am Okay, go ahead, Jude. Okay. Go 
ahead, Jude. You raised your hand, didn't you? Can you hear me? Yes, unmute yourself and go ahead. Okay. What's your name from Ampa? Sorry, I didn't get that. What's your name? Oh, oh the network is not so friendly. Miracle. Miracle, okay. Miracle, what's the temple? Place of worship. Okay. A temple is a place of worship. Thank you, Miracle. So can you imagine God calling your body a place of worship? Can you imagine that? God's spirit lives in your body. It's a place in which God, God, God has given you as an avenue to worship him. Okay? So the uncles in your different villages and aunties in your different villages will help you memorize the scripture so that by tomorrow or whenever we can um, re recite it, okay? So please keep the scripture in mind, 1 Corinthians 3, 16 to 17. Okay, so... When we talk about our bodies, most of the time we we'll assume, oh, it's my own body, it's my body, it's my body. But then we have to realize first that one, your body is first God's own. Okay? Before you claim any ownership to your body, remember it is first God's own. God created you, he owns you, so everything about you is God's own. Your body is first God's own. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 to 20 says, Do you not know that your body is a temple of God, of the Holy Spirit, rather, who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. You are not your own. Therefore, honor God with your body. You were bought with a price. What, what do you think that price is? When he says you are not your own, you were bought with a price, what does that mean? Jude, sorry, speak louder. Thank you, Jude. Yes, Jesus Christ is the price. His death on the cross was the price he had to pay. So you do not own yourself. You do not own your body. You were bought with a price. So honor God with your body. Okay? Imagine you go to the market and you buy, let's say, um, maybe, let's just imagine that you go and buy biscuits, for instance, and a biscuit can talk. And you buy the biscuit with your money, oh, and then you get home and you want to eat the biscuit and the biscuit says, oh, you know, you can't eat me. You can't eat me. No, 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 no. How would you feel? You, you had already gone to the market to buy the biscuits. You know that the biscuit is your own now because you bought it. And then the biscuit refuses not to let you eat it. And it starts dictating, no, you can't eat it and all that. That's, that's not how it works. God owns you already. He has bought you and so... Everything you have to do has to align with what God says, okay? So let me hear, in what ways can you dishonor your body? Because 1 Corinthians 6, 19 to 20 says, honor God with your body. Yes, we know. Okay, now, what ways can you dishonor God with your body? Okay. 
in what ways can you dishonor God with your body? One way is to dishonor your body is by engaging in sexual immorality. It's by engaging in sexual immorality. Okay, thank you. I do. By doing what? 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 Okay, thank you for exposing your body to what God, God does not want with your body. Thank you. What what can you expose your body to that God doesn't want? Things like what? Impurity. Yes, impurity. Yes. Okay. Don't worry. As as we continue, as we continue, you would you you would gain more understanding in Jesus' name. Okay. So let's see different ways. We are going to be looking at a few of the ways in which people. Okay. On the episode, I will come on. Uh, you can see the screen is still on. Teenagers, youth, and even have one way is to have strong to have mind. Can you hear me? Re re restart. Restart. Restart on your new screen. Okay. Okay. Sorry, the network is not so favorable. That's okay. We are going to be looking at different ways in which we can dishonor God with our bodies, including the ones you've listed. Lust is one of them. And lust means to have strong sexual desire for someone. Also, you might have heard the word pornography. Pornography, which means viewing maybe videos or pictures or writings that elicit sexual arous arousal that makes you think of lust, basically. This, and most of the time, this leads into people masturbating. Well, it is sort of peculiar with guys, but even girls, we find girls, unfortunately, these days engaging into masturbation. So it's not just a male thing like some people would think. Viewing pornography could, could um, trigger, could trigger this also. I like the fact that Jude from Olowa mentioned exposing your body to things God does not want. It could be smoking, it could be drinking, okay? Things that are harmful to your body, taking things that are harmful to your body also, are ways in which you dishonor God's temple. Remember we said God's temple is our body. It's a place of worship. God has chosen for us to worship him. So if you keep drinking, you keep smoking, you keep um, having sexual desires for somebody else, you keep viewing pornographic materials, videos of people maybe engaging in sexual intercourse or pictures of naked women or men or even romantic novels. It's quite common with the, um, amongst teenagers these days and youths. Reading romantic novels, all those things that would trigger your thoughts and your mind towards having sexual um, sexual arousal are things that dishonor 
God's temple are things that is honor God and that are things that God does not like. More definitions are well, we all know sexual activities like physical activities in which people touch each other's body or kiss each other. All these are related to sexual intercourse. And God specifically said in his word, all this must not happen. All this should not happen outside the confines of marriage. Now, when you hear marriage, most of the time in our world now, People will say, oh, I am married as a man. I'm married to this man. As a woman, I'm married to this woman. No. God's definition of marriage is a union between a man and a woman. Okay? And so God designed sexual intercourse. God designed sexual activities, physical activities between two people that are joined together by marriage. Another way in which we could dishonor God with our body is, I'm sorry, um, Nepa has, they've done their thing. Who can I quickly take two seconds to put on the inverter? Please do. So I can have illumination, okay. We'll take advantage for those who are- So like I said, marriage is between a man and a woman, between two people of the opposite sex and not between a man and a man or a man and a woman or even a man and an animal or a woman and an animal okay between two humans of the opposite sex anything outside of this is dishonoring god with your body and also another way we can dishonor god with our body is through incest and that's having sexual activities with a close relation either with your brother with your sister with your cousin a mother a father whatsoever that is dishonoring god and we'll see as time goes on how this is not something that just happened with the new age even in the bible We've had, we had cases of people engaging in such, in such um, activities and we'll see the consequence of these things. God completely frowns at it. Then we have, yeah, homosexuality also, like I was trying to explain when I talked about marriage, when a person is sexually attracted to their own sex, as a boy, you realize, oh, you keep liking a another boy and you're wondering, that is a sin, that is immoral, and that is against what God has originally designed. Remember, when God created man, he created Adam, and God said, it's not good for man to be alone, I want to create a helpmeet. And God created woman to help out, to be a partner, to be a companion to the man. God didn't create another man to be a companion to Adam, okay? So it is completely dishonoring God to have sexual relations with somebody of your own sex. It is not a way in which God has ordained for you to worship him with your body, okay? Now, let's look at this. It would be really nice for us to read it. So um, let's, let's open the book of Genesis. Genesis 19, 1 to 11. How many, how many locations do we have? So each person from each location could pick maybe two, two verses. The rest of us should please follow through. Genesis 19, verse 1, people of Sodom and Gomorrah. All the things they did and the consequences of their actions. Okay. Let's start with um, 
Okay, I think Uncle Counted Night Groups when we're going to our Bible studies. Yes, please. So, okay, let's take one verses for now. One verses for each of the locations. Olowa, you can start. Then um, Samuel Jereku. Then Pete Lube. Then Emere. Then Ibaji one, Ibaji two. Where else am I leaving out? Some uh, other group also. Um, Let's just keep reading like that. Yes. yes. What did you say? Someone from all of us should please take Genesis 19 verse 1. The two angels are the sun in the evening, and Lord was the same. When the Lord was the same, the Lord was the same, and the Lord was the same. My Lord, he said, Please come and thank you. My Lord, he said, Please come and say to your servant, You can wash your feet and spend the night. And then go on your way early in the morning. Finish, finish, finish with us. That's not hard. Finish, oh, yeah, finish the verse. My Lord, please don't aside to your seven thousand and watch your feet. And spend the night and then go on your way early in the morning. No, they say you will spend the night in the square. Okay, the next yes. location. Three, but he insisted so strongly that they that they did with him and enter his house. He, he prepared a meal for them, taking bread. So strongly, taking bread without the before they had gone to the bed. Before they had gone to the bed, all the men from every part of the city of Sodom, both young and old, surrounded the house. Okay. Okay. Go to Lord, where they are the. You can have sex with them. Last went outside to meet them and shut the door behind him. Um. 
small groups. Which other group haven't have spoken? Mio Loco. Mio Loco. Nobody has read from Mio Loco. Mio Loco. I said, I beg you, my brother, do not act so wickedly. Two more. Should I just finish up for you? I'll start from verse 8. Okay? So we won't spend much time. It says, look, I have, I have two daughters who have never slept with a man. Let me bring them out to you and you can do what you like with them. But don't do anything to these men for they have come under the protection of my roof. Get out of my way, they replied. This fellow came here as a foreigner and now he wants to play the judge. We'll treat you worse than this. They kept bringing, they kept bringing men, they kept bringing pressure on Lot and moved forward to break down the door. But the men inside reached out and pulled Lot back inside the house and shut the door. Then they struck the men who were at the door of the house, young and old with blindness so that they could not find the door and then we find out much later i'm sure you might be familiar with the story of the people of sodom and gomorrah we find out much later that lot and his family were able to leave and in verse 24 he said it said he says then the lord rained down burning sulfur on sodom and gomorrah from the lord out of the heavens. Then he overthrew those cities and the entire plain, destroying all those living in the cities and also within and also the vegetation in the land. We had seen from previous stories that the people of Sodom and Gomorrah engaged in various acts of sexual immorality. Incest, because we could see here that the men were trying to sleep with, his, with, with lots of visitors. We see that they engage in incest. We see that they were doing several things that point to dishonoring their bodies, dishonoring God's temple. And look at, you saw the consequence of the actions here. Everyone in that city, every building, every animal, every Thing there was burnt down because of their actions. So aside from aside from um, from, will I say God's direct vengeance on people who commit such acts? We find now, let's say for instance, you engage in premarital sex. There's a high chance you would get pregnant. There's a high chance you might have diseases, sexual, sexually transmitted diseases. There's a high chance you, you there, are, there are different things that you, you expose your, your, yourself to just because of your actions, just because you, you choose to dishonor God, you choose, to, you choose not to worship God, with your body. There are different things that you expose yourself to that are not good and healthy for you. So let's see, with all this that we've said, how does God expect me to treat my body? What are the things that God says about how I treat my body? 
like I said before, and what um, Judah in Olowa mentioned, you drink, you smoke, you endanger your health. You could have issues with your lungs. You could have issues with your liver. Generally, you would have issues with your health because you chose to do the wrong things. You chose to dishonor God for your body. And you would definitely pay for those actions. And so let's see, what does God command us to do? Who wants to read for me? Matthew 5, 28. If you can read from the screen, that's fine, since it's, um, it's available here. engage in the heart. Just thinking about it. Oh, you see that girl and you're like, oh, see that girl, she has big bum bum. Oh, she has big breasts. And you start imagining things. He says you've actually committed that sin. You fornicated already. Or you've committed adultery already. Okay? So it, it, it might not... It, it might not even have to be that you go far enough to actually doing that thing. Remember what we said in Ephesians 5 verse 3 yesterday. There must not be even an int of sexual immorality. This is the int it's talking about here in Matthew 5 verse 28. He says, if you look at a woman lustfully, you've committed the act already in your heart. And it's considered a sin. You've dishonored God. You've dishonored the woman also. Because remember we said, you treat everyone with dignity and value. You treat everyone with dignity and value. So looking at a woman lustfully, looking at a woman and having crazy thoughts or crazy ideas in your head is dishonoring God with your body because your heart already you started thinking different things. Your mind has started working in ways you shouldn't work. And then you are dishonoring that woman also by thinking of her naked or thinking of her in, in different other ways. Okay? Who else wants to read Leviticus 18? Oh, okay, yes. Let's read Leviticus 18. We'll take it one step at a time because this, na this narrates different dimensions to, to what we are talking about, to um, different ways in which we dishonor God. And then the chapter 20 specifically describes the punishment. So let's check out Leviticus chapter 18. Can we read? Yes, please. Read yes, it. Yes. Go on. What's your name? No one is to approach fate. Okay, fate. For my Yingba. Okay. Yes. Go on. Verse 6. No one, no one is to approach any close relative to have sexual relations. I am the Lord. Do not dishonor your father by having sexual relations with your mother. She is your mother. Do not have relations with her. Do not have okay, sexual on, relations hold with on, your Faith. father. Faith, hold on. You keep reading, don't worry. Just hold on for now. You see that it says, no one is to approach any sex, any close relative to have sexual relations. Don't dishonor your father by having sexual relations with your mother. Don't dishonor your mother. She is your mother, rather. Do not have sexual relations with her. What is that called? What did you say that is called? What word did we give it? Incest. Yes. yes, incest. So you see that right from the Bible days, it's been a thing. 
and God says specifically, do not do that. Okay, Faith, continue. Verse 8, do you not have sexual relations with your father's wife that would dishonor your father? Verse 9, do you not have sexual relations with your sister, neither your father's daughter or your mother's daughter, whether she was born in the same homes or elsewhere? Verse 10, do you not have sexual relations with your son's daughter or your, your daughter's daughter? That's who disown, dis, disown, disown you. Verse 11, do not have sexual relations with the daughters of your father's wife, born to your father, she is your sister. Verse 12, do not have sexual relations with your father's sister, she is your father's close relative. 13, okay, so you see now, do not okay, hold, on, your, hold on, faith. So you see now that all of these things describes incest, okay? And God says that is wickedness. Aside from you disobeying God, mm -hmm. you are disobeying the parties, the different parties that it, it is affected also. And it is wrong. So let's go to, let's go to chapter 20 and see the consequences for these actions if you decide to disobey. What were the consequences? Let's start from let's start from chapter ten. Look at the consequences that befell them for the actions they did. Twenty ten. If a man commits adultery with another man's wife, with the wife of his neighbor, both the adulterer and the adulteress are to be put to death. Keep reading. If a man commits adultery with, if a man has sexual relations with his father's wife, he has dishonored his father. Both the man and the woman are to be put to death. Their blood will be on their own heads. If a man has sexual relations with his daughter-in-law, both of them are to be put to death. What they have done is perversion. Their blood will be on their own heads. If a man has sexual relations with a man as one does with a woman, both of them have done what is detestable. They are to be put to death. They have not to be okay. on their own way. Even okay, thank you. Thank you, Faith. Thank you, Faith. So this we see here. No, Faith. The, oh, sorry, dear. I'm sorry. Okay, Mary. Thank you, Mary. Glory. So we see here that glory. Okay, okay. <laughs> thank you, glory. <laughs> so we see here that God clearly told them, do not do this, do not do this. And then there were consequences of their actions. Like I said now, if we engage in this act, we may not have consequences of actions like they did in those times. But definitely, there will be consequences for actions. Like I said before, you engage in premarital sex. What is premarital sex? Sex between two people that are not married to each other. P two people that are single, they are not married and they engage in sexual activities. That is premarital sex. There's a likelihood you get pregnant. Pregnancy brings shame, right? It brings shame. You might have to stop going to school. You would be a mother early and um, too early in life be a father to hell in life as the case may be you might contact diseases that are most times very very difficult to cure and might take you getting medications and cure almost for the rest of your lives the stigma the, the stigma the society gives you also so many things just get stopped or paused because of the activities you engage in 
So it might not even be, oh, like, like it was then for the people in Leviticus, you will die immediately. But then there are consequences of our actions. I remember the book of Hebrews says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, which is better to obey or to sacrifice. Okay, now let's read Leviticus 18. Verse 22. What does it say? Do not lie to do not lie with the man as one that that detestable. It is detestable. It says do not lie with a man as one lies with a woman. That is the what it means, it is disgusting. <laughs> okay. It says that is detestable, that is disgusting, that should even be aired off. As a man, do not have sexual activities with a man. As a woman, do not have sexual activities with a woman. It is disgusting. Don't even entertain that thought. Don't even think of it. Okay? Now, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 to 11. He says, don't you know that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't be deceived. Neither the sexual immoral or the idolaters or adulterers, nor male prostitutes, nor homosexual offenders, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Don't be deceived. Okay, from our Bible study, chapter four, those things that people who live in the world does and people who are called to serve God does. We, we've seen the difference. We see people that live in darkness. We've seen people that live in light. All these things, if you claim that you live in light, if you claim that you are called, live a life worthy of that calling. Okay, like the memory verse for today says, live a life worthy of that calling. Do not engage in all of this. Do not engage in things that would dishonor God's temple. Do not engage in things that would dishonor your body. Do things with your body as a way of worship to God. Okay? Now, let's look at Romans 1, 25 to 27. The author was talking about a particular set of people here. He says, they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. Amen. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lust. Even their women exchanged national, natural relations for natural ones. When, when it says natural relations for unnatural ones, natural means between a male and a female. That is how God has designed it. That is how it's meant to be. But then when you go behind and you do the opposite, it's the unnatural ones. Also, the men also engage natural, natural relations with men and were inflamed with lust for one another. Remember what, what the verse we read in Leviticus said, it says it says that is disgusting, it is irritating, it is detestable. Men committed indecent acts with other men and received in themselves the due punishment or penalty for their perversion. There's always consequence for our actions. There is always consequence for our actions. And let's look at more things that God says here. I I purposely added the message version to this and NLT because it explains it more for me. First Thessalonians 4, 3 to 5 and 4 to the 7. This verse has helped me almost all my life. It says, it is God's will for you to be holy. So stay away from all sexual sin then each of you will control his own body and live in holiness and honor, not in lustful passion like the pagans who do not know God and his ways. God has called us to live 
holy lives, not impure lives. It is not unusual for you to have feelings, okay? God created everyone with emotions. Times might come when you might start feeling some sort of way, funny ways towards the opposite sex, like we said yesterday. Times like come might come when you start wondering, why am I always thinking of that boy? Why am I always thinking of that girl? Why am I? And you want to do things that God does not approve of. A time in my life came like that. And this verse was what helped me all through. I remember my husband now, we were not married yet, it was my fiancé. He had to write it down on a, on a cardboard, on a small cardboard paper and gave me, I pasted on the wall of my room. So as I'm waking up and I'm sleeping, as I'm sleeping rather than waking up, I wake up to see it and I'm reminded that God says I can have self-control. God says I should stay away from sexual sins. He says I should live in holiness and honor. So every time I remind myself that I'm not a pagan, I'm not an unbeliever, I should not live in lustful passion. And so when, times when I find myself maybe in the same room with my fiancé or in the, same, in the same place and I start having those funny feelings that might want to lead to something unholy, I remind myself of first Thessalonians 4, 3 to 5. That's why I might be biased, but that's why I just had to put it in two different versions. Because the message version says, God wants me to live a pure life. He wants you to live a pure life. Keep yourselves from sexual promiscuity. Learn to appreciate and give dignity to your body. Your body is not a commodity. It's not, it's not, a, it's not for everyone. Your body is God's body. He just gave you as a custodian. Okay? So he says, learn to appreciate and give dignity to your body. It is God's temple. He wants you to take care of it. He wants you to worship him with it. Not abusing it as is common among people who do not, who do not know anything about God. But do you know God? Yes, you do. And you are here because you want to keep learning more about God and to obey God. So don't act like those people that do not know anything about God. God has invited us. In verse 7, it says, God has invited us into a dis God hasn't rather invited us into a disorderly, unkept life, but into something holy and beautiful, as beautiful on the inside as the outside. So he doesn't want you to come and say, oh, my name is Favor, my dad is an elder, my mommy is a deacon in church, I'm a good girl. And then on the inside, it is all rotten and detestable and disgusting. No. It says God wants you to live a life that is holy and beautiful. Let what people are seeing outside match what is inside of you. Okay. Let your thoughts be holy and pure. Do not look at that woman lustfully and yet come and say, I'm a child of God, I love God, I do not sin and all of that. No, let what is shown outside be um, synonymous to what is inside of you. God wants you to live a pure life. Keep yourselves from sexual promiscuity. Keep yourselves from things that would dishonor your body. Do not drink. Do not smoke. Do not have unholy thoughts. Learn to appreciate and give honor to your body and also to other people's bodies. Okay? See that person as someone who is valuable to God. See that person as someone God died for and shouldn't be looked at like a property. Do not abuse your body as is common among those who know nothing of God. God hasn't invited you into a life that is unkept or disorderly. Don't be all over the place. Just, oh, go chasing after this girl or chasing after that girl or doing things that doesn't honor God. He has called you into something holy and beautiful, as beautiful on the inside as the outside. Okay?
Now, this verse sums it up for me. Who knows Romans 12? I shouldn't ask who knows. I should assume that all of you know. But then, Romans 12, 1 and 2. You might want to try with Romans 12, 1. Okay, let's hear. Who knows Romans 12, 1? Marvelous, I think I remember. Aha, it's good you're raising you up your hand first because it was one of those verses we learned those years in Ivaji. Okay, Marvelous. My Romans 12, 1. Romans 12, 1. I urge you, brother, to offer your body as holy and pleasing to God. This is the spiritual act of worship. Thank you. Who else wants to try? Thank you. Thank you so much, marvelous. Who else wants to try? Amen. Favor. Okay, favor. Don't worry. If mm -hmm. The other group will not let will talk. Okay, favor. Go ahead. Okay, ma. Romans twelve one. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your body as living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Romans 12, 1. Thank you. Okay, Barnabas, you were raising your hand. Romans 5, 12. I mean, Romans 12, 1 to 2. Therefore, Good. I owe you your full mercy to offer your body as living sacrifice, only and pleasing to God. This is a spiritual act of worship. Romans 12, 1 to 2. No, that's just Romans 12, 1. Who knows verse 2? Who wants to give verse 2 a try? Who wants to give verse 2 a try? Okay, I'll help you out. Verse 2 says, do not conform any longer to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. Is good, pleasing, and perfect will. Okay? He says, Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifice. What's a sacrifice? It's something that is given away, Right? maybe in atonement for something or to get something and all. But God says, now give your body away to me. Give me your body. Sacrifices most of the time involves you having to kill that thing. Maybe you want them, like in the Bible days, when they want to sacrifice lambs or bulls or animals generally, they have to kill those animals. But God says, as you live your life, as you go to school, as you go to the farm, as you go to the market, as you play, he says, offer your bodies as living sacrifices. As you do the day-to-day -day thing, do everything in a way that is sacrificial to God. Offer your bodies as living sacrifices, only unacceptable. I remember we said a temp what a temple is. Somebody from, sorry, forgive me, I can't remember your name now, but you said a temple is a place of worship. Yes. And we said our body is a place of worship, is a place God has chosen for us to worship in. So it says, offer this body as a living sacrifice. Make it holy and acceptable. And it says it is your spiritual act of worship. Doing that is a way in which you worship God. Don't be like the people of the world. Don't be like those people that do not know God. Don't be like those pagans. Don't conform to their patterns. But be transformed from the inside. When it says renewing of your mind, it has to start from the inside. Remember it says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So it has to start from the inside. Renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. It's good, pleasing, and perfect will. Don't worry about the fact that, oh, my friends are doing it now. <laughs> Which one is God? This God's will is not, is not perfect at all. Trust me, it is the best for you. So do not 
don't 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 look at don't look at friends what your friends are doing or what you see on social media i'm sure most of you like facebook you're always on facebook 24 7. don't look at what is on facebook or what what you see around you don't conform to those to those things be transformed by the renewing of your mind and like i would always say i'm a big fan of scripture memory like i would always say knowing god's word helps you fight temptations in the world so hide god's word in your heart yesterday we started from first Timothy 5 1 and 2 today it is first corinthians 3 16 and 17. there are so many verses like that um ephesians 5 verse 3 even romans 12 verse 1 and 2 there are so many verses that would help you fight against temptations. You are in the world, these things will come. You still have flesh, these things will come. But God's word is true and sufficient to be able to help you fight this and help you properly honor your body, which is God's temple. I pray that as we um, go think about these things, we would realize continually that we do not own our bodies. God just gave us as custodians, as keepers. They, they would say, maybe caretakers, as, as, as people might say, but it is God's own. You know how, how a person built a house, he's a landlord, but he gives somebody, oh, let me take care of this. But the landlord still owns the house, right? That is how it is. So God has given you the task of taking care of his body, of his temple. So what would you do with it? Do you want God to say, oh, good and faithful servant, you did well with my body, you did well with my temple, or you want God to be sad and shake his head? It's left for you. So I hope that we will keep learning and God will keep convince, convincing us to do all the right things that we should do. Thank you. If you have questions, you can write them down. I'm, I'm hoping there would be a later time for us to address questions. Thank you again. I am done.